So I was raised down on Long Island, down on the south shore of Long Island, down living on the water on the Great South Bay. And one of the things that we used to do was go fishing and clamming. And another thing we would do is we would go out with a seine net, like 20 feet long and two people, one on each end, dragging it along and then pulling in all sorts of fish. We still would go do it down by the, the Fire Island Inlet. And we bring in all kinds of fish with our kids, things like little angel fish and puffer fish, even some seahorses, um, all different kinds of things. So this kind of story that Jesus is telling today, it's a parable, a story that relates to people uh, in and where they live, uh, kind of in an existential way. Uh, it relates to me and it related to people back then. Many of them were fishermen, lived on the water there. Uh, this parable of Jesus, it's the parable of the net. It's uh, uh, in the context of several different parables here that are taught by Jesus. Uh, Jesus is teaching about the kingdom of heaven like he does many times. And he's telling about how we have this dual citizenship in heaven uh, and here on earth. Uh, the parable is very similar to a parable he just told earlier in the chapter, the parable of the, the wheat and the weeds. And some people read this passage, this parable here, they hear the first words that are spoken by Jesus, uh, kind of an introduction to the parable. And it says in verse 47, once again, the kingdom of heaven is like, and they think, I've heard this before. In fact, I've just heard this several times as Jesus was telling other parables in this chapter here. How many times do I need to hear about the kingdom of heaven. Uh, and parables, uh, just like here in Matthew 13, there are six of them alone right here in Matthew 13. Um, they talk about the kingdom of heaven many times. Uh, they're not all the same. They have different facets and different characteristics about the kingdom of heaven, but some of it's just the same. So we'll talk about that some more in a minute. In Matthew 13, verses 47 to 50, we come and we read this passage here, this, this parable of Jesus. And it's really a, it's a fish story, a parable of the net. So reading from verse 47, chapter 13, this is God's word. Jesus said, Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, Jesus understood the value of repetition, and that's why I think he kept talking about the kingdom of heaven over and over. Uh, somebody has said regarding education, repetition is the mother of knowledge, and knowledge is the mother of application, and application is the mother of habit. One reason we don't walk faithfully with God a lot of times is that faithfulness has not become a habit in our lives. Obedience to God hasn't become a habit in our lives. Jesus understood that for believers in him, followers of him, if you repeat something over and over, it begins to, to permeate your being. It becomes to, to really live itself out regularly, all the time. That's why God's told us that we are to assemble together for worship every week. That's why we study scripture, and why it's so important to do that on a regular basis, not just here on a weekly basis, but on your own even if you've read it before, to go back and read it over and over and over. Faithfulness, faithfulness needs to be a habit. Philippians 4.8 says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Let those kind of things become a part of you. Let it become a habit to live in this way. Back when my son Tommy was uh, in eighth grade uh, studying history, and uh, I have to full disclosure, um, I, uh, I had feelings for Tommy's teacher, and uh, uh, it's my wife Stacy. Uh, she he was homeschooled, um, and so 
they would kind of go over some of the same things each year, but maybe in a deeper way. And so as they're going over history that year, uh, Tommy says to Stacy, it's always the same thing. How many times do I need to hear that Tonto helped out the Pilgrims? And to that, Stacy says, Tommy, it's Squanto, not Tonto. Well, a repetition is so important because we have to get the basics down pat. We have to have grasped the fundamental knowledge of the faith and have that permeate our being so that it just, it's second nature to us. So we almost don't have to think about it. It's like driving. You step out onto the road, you don't even think about it many times. Um, our faithfulness then becomes a habit. Uh, last year, Stacy and I went to go visit Kaylee over in London as she's working with Youth with a Mission, and, and we took a, a side excursion over to Paris. Uh, we both taken French and studied all about France, but uh, I had gotten a bunch of books from Ken McMullen, who works for a, a French bank, and he'd give me all, the, he knows Paris really well, but in fact, he asked me which uh, arrondissement I was staying in. I thought, what is he talking about? It's the, one of the neighborhoods there in Paris. And, and I read through lots of these books and looked things up, restaurants and places to go and uh, how to enjoy it the best we could. And we were just going there for a few days. Um, so if you think about this, uh, if you're planning on going to heaven, if you're a believer in Jesus, how much do you need to know about the kingdom of heaven? I would say lots, because you're not just going there to spend a few days, you're going to spend eternity. So why wouldn't you want to learn so much about it? And, and that's why Jesus is encouraging us and promising us all these things about the kingdom of heaven. So as we look at this today, I want you to first see the universal extent or reach of the kingdom. Uh, I want you to note this first. That everybody gets brought in by this net. Uh, all kinds get brought in, just like that, that, as I said, all those kinds of fish were brought in by that same net that we would pull along through the water there. But some will not have believed. Some will not have been saved that are dragged in by that net. In verse 47, Jesus said there, once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. The gospel is cast out into the world, to everybody, all over the place. Uh, and this points us to the important and the focus of missions and evangelism in the church and, and in our lives personally. In Acts 1.8, kind of an introduction, kind of a theme verse for, for the book of Acts there. Uh, it says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's Jesus speaking to the disciples, but it also applies to us. Missions is so key for the Christian church. Some churches are not very big on missions. They think, you know, we need to first take care of ourselves and, and worry about our ministry here. Um, our former presbytery, when we were in the PCUSA, before we were in the Evangelical Presbyterian Church, um, they would ask every year for a pledge for missions and to give through the presbytery. We never gave anything to them, for we gave money on our own to lots of missionaries, but we didn't give any money to them because 60 or 65 percent of their missions budget went to themselves. It was just for their own their own taking care of their own selves and their own uh, functioning in the presbytery there. Um, well, we look and we see how important missions is, and that's why we give so much to missions. And so many of the people here in this church have such a great focus on missions and have been praying for them all the time. There's a, a story of a man named Alexander Duff. He's a, a famous missionary to India. Uh, he was from Scotland, a good Scot, and he went back to Scotland after serving in India for so many years. He went back there as an old man, and he was teaching about what God was doing in India. He was so excited about how the gospel was just taking off, and, and people by the droves were coming to faith in Jesus. And as he was teaching there in this church, after two and a half hours, 
he collapsed in the pulpit. And some men came over, they picked him up, and they brought him back to a back room. And when he came to, he was confused. He didn't know where he was. And then he realized, wait, I'm here at the church, and I was speaking. And then he realized that he was not finished yet. And he said, I must go back and, and finish telling them about what's this exciting ministry, this mission that's going on in India. And there was a doctor there with him, and he said, Dr. Duff, if you go back, you will die. And Dr. Duff replied, if I don't, I will die. Um, and he understood that being in a relationship with Jesus uh, what means that you have this need to, to this imperative to reach out to others with the gospel. And he wanted others in that congregation there to see and to understand how imperative it was for them to follow this command, this, the great commission to go out and reach others and see them become disciples of Christ. Uh, that's why we support missions here. Our mission to the world grows out of our personal relationship with Jesus. Our call to reach all peoples in all places with the gospel, it's universal. It's for all Christians. And we have an opportunity to reach people right here at home, uh, in our own lives, in our own community. We've got people from all over the world, all people groups, right here in New York. Um, and many of them will go out into the world. They'll move on and go back to their other countries or move away from here, and they'll be able to bring the gospel and change lives for others. So it's sad to see some people come and go, and we know that they'll only be here for a few years, and then they'll be moving on, maybe even back to their, their old country. But the exciting thing is to know that this is kind of a missions outpost. We're sending people out to, to follow that call and, and our mission to reach the world with the gospel. So we see this universal extent and reach of the gospel um, and of uh, the kingdom. But I want you to understand, as I said, it's universal. Don't get scared. This is not universalism. Uh, there are the bad fish who are sorted out, those who don't come to faith in Christ, who are not welcomed into the kingdom. They're not, uh, not all will be welcomed into the kingdom. We don't believe in universalism, that everybody's going to go to heaven. Uh, John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That means nobody, not one person, will get to heaven except for by faith in Jesus Christ. There's a, a universal reach, a, a gospel that universally goes out to all, and there's a universal acceptance uh, of all who believe in Christ. They all will get to heaven. And there's also, unfortunately, a, a universal rejection of all those who don't put their faith in Christ. And that's sad, and it's tragic, but it's true. It's biblical, and that's the fact. So we present the gospel to people unapologetically and hope that they come to faith in God. And it's about God working and changing their hearts and then them taking that step of faith. Uh, so we uh, indiscriminately get involved in missions and give our money to missions. Uh, and, and we indiscriminately get involved in personal evangelism as well to everybody, anybody in your lives. And don't ever count anybody out. Understand that God can bring anybody to faith. Um, so we seek to reach all with the gospel. So we see this universal extent and reach of the kingdom. The second thing I want you to see is the definition of the kingdom. Verses 48 to 49, um, it talks about when the fishermen pulled in this, this net from the lake and they pulled it on to shore, they sat down, they collected up all the good fish in baskets, and then they sorted out all the bad fish and they threw them out. And it says, this is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous. And, and we think back to the Old Testament as we read this. Um, the Old Testament had rules on what you could eat, what you couldn't eat, what was clean and what was unclean. And in Leviticus 11, as it's talking about these kind of things that you can and can't eat or that the Jews could and couldn't eat, it's clearly taught that there are some bad fish and there are some good fish. There are some fish that are clean and some fish that are unclean. And it says that the unclean fish 
have no scales. They have no fin and you can't eat those kind of fish. In fact, you're supposed to detest them, it says. And Jesus is taking a principle from God's word and applying it to this parable here. And it wasn't really as much about fish in the Old Testament there either. It was talking about the Jews and the Gentiles, those that were in the family of God and those that were outside the family of God. And then eventually the Gentiles and the new covenant are brought into the family of God and hence those dietary restrictions, they're no more. Besides the fact that Jesus came and fulfilled all of those things. So some of the fish are good fish and some are bad fish. But you and I are not the ones who judge which is which. We will not know that. Sometimes it might seem clear, but only God really knows the heart. Only God can see what's in the heart. And only God knows what will in the future be in the heart. And God knows when a person will teach, will, will turn to him, or if they will turn to him. He's sovereign and he's in control. And it's not for you to judge whether somebody will or will not come to faith in him. Because you don't know. Someday you will know when you get to heaven and you see those brothers or sisters in Christ that are there. I don't know if you'll even remember who it was that you spoke to that's not there, though. So the kingdom attracts all kinds, good and bad. Verse 47, it talks about the net that pulled in all kinds of fish, people from all tribes and all nations all over the world. And uh, I, I think of, though, Corey Ten Boom, and she had said that sleeping in a garage does not make you a car. Um, just because somebody goes to church, some people appear to be Christians, doesn't mean that they necessarily are. Um, now, we, we just assume people that are coming to church that appear to be Christians, living at the last faith, we assume that they're Christians. But coming to church, hanging around Christians, doesn't make you a Christian here. There's a difference between hanging around the king and being submissive to the king, giving your life to him, uh, radically following him, and, and doing it in this extreme way that we've been called, like, like we talked about last week. And that's what Jesus is telling us. Uh, but the determination is not for us to make, but for him to make in the end. So we see people here and we judge them by their fruits. We see them here in the church. We, we welcome them in and we just hope that they continue to walk faithfully. So I want you to see the universal reach of the kingdom and the definition of the kingdom. Lastly, as we close up, I want you to see the, the glorious result of the kingdom. Um, you're, uh, as a kid, uh, I remember watching the show Hee Haw. And uh, growing up in New York, it's going to be hard to believe I watched a show like Hee Haw. Uh, I guess it, there wasn't a whole lot on television back then. But I can remember this one thing. The one guy would say, hey Otis, I got some good news and some bad news. You want the good news first or the bad news? Well, first, if we talk about this, the bad news is um, that there are people that will not get into the kingdom of heaven. They will not come to follow Jesus, even though they're invited, even though it's so attractive, even though we see how rational and how, why wouldn't somebody want to live this way and have eternal life? But there are some that will not follow and they will not get in. And, and unfortunately, the, the horrible end that they will have is the weeping and gnashing of teeth in hell. I don't even know what that really entails, but it certainly doesn't sound good. So there's the bad news. But I don't want to leave off with just bad news here um, and leave off with hell and the, the weeping and gnashing of teeth. So going back up to one of those other parables that I, I mentioned earlier, which covers some of the same thing, the sorting out of the wheat and the weeds there and the judgment of God. Um, so back earlier in the chapter there, in verse 43, at the end of the parable of the weeds, uh, there's really the same point of the parable that's being, being made there. They're harvesting and bringing everything in and then they're sorting everything out, the good and the bad there. But there's a much happier ending in that parable there. In verse 43, it says, Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. At the end of the age, when the wicked and the righteous are separated, the good fish and the bad fish, or the wheat and the weeds, the wicked will go their way to judgment, to hell. 
and the righteous will go God's way to heaven. It's really both God's way, but they'll go to heaven to live eternally. And it's important to understand where that righteousness comes from that gets them in to heaven. It's not a righteousness from doing good deeds. It's not from going to church. It's not from being nice or seeming faithful or obedient to God. The righteousness that Jesus talks about, uh, the righteous that Jesus talks about, are not those who get their righteousness from within themselves. The righteous that Jesus talks about are those who get their righteousness from outside of themselves. It comes from Jesus. And Jesus takes that and he puts it upon us. They are righteous not because of what they've done, but they are righteous because of what Christ has done for them. Both on the cross, in taking their penalty, they're, they're taking their sins off of them and putting them on Jesus, and Jesus suffers the penalty for those sins, and also for taking Jesus' righteousness and putting it upon them. So that's what we have in salvation. We have our sins taken off us, and we have Jesus' righteousness put on us. When people are shopping for diamonds, uh, they look for three things, supposedly, the three C's. Color, clarity, and carrots. The color, they're looking for white, a pure color there. For clarity, they're looking for no imperfections, no little marks inside there. And carrots, they're just looking for, for bigness there, or at least some people maybe want smaller, who knows. But God takes us with all of our imperfections. God takes us with all of our dirt and guilt that makes us not look white and clean. And he cleans us up and he shines us up. And he doesn't just help us to be more righteous, to live more righteously. But uh, he gives us Christ righteousness, perfect righteousness that will be with us forever. That's what we have in salvation. So we don't have to worry that we're not righteous one day and God's gonna get us. No, you put your faith in Jesus, God's not gonna get you. You've already gotten your way into heaven. You've, it's been earned for you by Jesus. And he sees us like he sees his son Jesus. So at the end of the age, we'll all be standing around the throne and we will shine like the sun. S-U-N, like it said there in verse 43. And we will shine like the sun, S-O-N, like Jesus. So praise God that every day we shine for Jesus. So go out, take that message of the gospel for others in missions and evangelism, and shine like the sun. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you have drawn us into your kingdom. We thank you for this important teaching on the kingdom, and we ask that you would help us to first have a heart for the lost, for missions and evangelism, and then also to realize that righteousness that we have, the salvation that we have, it all comes from you, and that we would take that and live for you in obedience, but also taking that message out to others and shine like you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.